morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, it's Scott Ramp, and I got lots to talk about today. I got some news items. I got it's First Friday. I got all your First Friday art guide to guide you through First Friday. It, it happens every f uh, First Friday of the month from 5 to 8 p.m. I got weather. I got a brand new uh, um, uh, video f uh, from uh, Flagship Friday. So it's Flagship Friday. Um, I'm, I'm really struggling with you today, but let me. D and I also have a guest. Uh, there's a lot of things happening today. Uh, I got pre-critic. I have a guest, Jody Pilgrim from the Missoula Park Commission. She's talking about food for fines. So we'll talk about all that and more um, later on in the show. But let's kick it off with a little bit of weather. There is a winter advisory warning happening from now until Saturday at 9 a.m. You have that 100% chance of snow happening pretty much all day into about 80% tonight. And it will start slowing down uh, Saturday. And then it will start picking up <laughs> once again for Sunday. So it is currently 34 degrees outside. Your high is going to be 36, so expect those cold temperatures to be in the air. Um, your lows are going to be in the 25, so it's going to stay fairly moderate. No um, exponential uh, uh, decline in your uh, temperature whatsoever. So expect a nice, snowy, wintry day for any of you who are planning on going out and about. So um, let's talk about some local news. Uh, Looks like the Historic Museum at Fort Missoula is getting a little bit more historic um, as the used book sale is in full swing from now until Sunday. Uh, some but lucky book buyer found a hundred-year-old outdoorsman book called Pocket Guide to the Common Land Birds of New England. Um, all the way from New Hampshire, a man who uh, died in the 1940s um, basically uh, sold and resold this book and basically it was in circulation for so long and it ended up in Fort Missoula. So the book had clovers and plants that are dated back in the in that era over a hundred years ago and the person buying these books are uh, buying them by the inches but not how old they are. So Desi Rogers with Fort Missoula said workers were almost overwhelmed by the volume of books donated for this year's sale. A book website uh, a book sale website provided a formula in um, count such thing to count such things. Sorry about that. Um, for more information about the book sale at Fort Missoula, you can go to the Historic Museum at Fort Missoula on Facebook, or you go to fortmissoula.org. In state news, uh, U.S. Candid Senate candidate Russell Fagg said he would he will fight a political group's accusation that the former Billings judge uh, violated a federal campaign law. Fagg's campaign. Exploratory Committee is being accused of uh, campaigning for the months leading up to the GOP primary hearings for U.S. Senator. Uh, ADLF is asking for Federal Election Commission to require FEG to disclose any fundraising or campaign spending that occurred during his Exploratory Committee phase. So just so you guys know, an Exploratory ca um, Committee, which is, illegal and, uh, which is legal and allows people who are candidates uh, who, who are curious candidates, basically, to test the political waters under softer financial disclosure standards than full-blown political campaign. A uh, person who has decided to run cannot continue on exploratory sta status. The issue is whether or not Russell Flagg was um, an actual candidate during this uh, um, exploratory phase. So that's uh, something that's going on right now in the state news. And, um, of course, I also heard on the radio that... Uh, uh, a jail in Harding uh, hopes to reopen and start getting some more people in jail. So <laughs> look out for that. Um, in national news, the president tweeted furiously as the legal actions were unveiled, unveiled, sorry about that, um, um, rallying about the focus on the Russian interference story by the press and by implication the special counsel. His rage provoked speculation that he may, uh, may s might seek to abort the DOJ investigation by fi firing Robert Mueller or pardoning uh, Manafort and others as a way of choking off the probe. So far, the Dem Department of Justice, led by Robert Mueller, picked up the public pace as uh, of, the t of his team's investigation of the Russian interference of the 2016 presidential election. Tuesday, reps from social media organization revealed that Russia Russian had bought ads from Facebook and other social media outlets the day of the election, swaying the vote in, fav in Trump's favor. Um, or... A lot of times, uh, what uh, what happened during this particular election is that uh, Julian Assange records were released. But of course, Julian Assange also had an axe to grind against Hillary as well. So there's a lot of things that were working against Hillary during this past election. So as more and more uh, Trump's pardoning powers begin to fall behind red tape in terms of the Constitution, Constitution basically gives presidents broad powers to grant pardons for offenses against the United States. 
against the United States except in cases of impeachment. So that means he can pardon anyone charged with federal crime, but not state crimes. Um, and he can prevent his own impeachment by pardoning him, and he can't um, um, prevent his own impeachment by pardoning himself. So President Trump could pardon any of the individuals under scrutiny in the Mueller's Russian probe, and that would deprive the special counsel of its leverage, his ability to pressure witnesses to get the truth, and in short, a series of pardons could seriously impede um, Robert Mueller's inquiry. So that's basically a lot of things that are happening in and around the United States. Um, there's a lot of happening. There's always a lot happening. And I suggest you guys go, go to NPR.org. You guys can go to the Billings Gazette. And, of course, you can always go to the Missoulian to find out more information about some of the news that, like I did um, in terms of sharing. So I have a guest on. So I'm going to show you an art clip from the Missoula Art Museum. And when I come back, I'm going to have uh, – Judy Pilgrim from the uh, Missoula Parking Commission. Stay with me. guys we're back here with Jody Pilgrim and she's from the Missoula Parking Commission and she's here to talk about the a November campaign event that the Missoula Parking Commission is doing and that's called Food for Fines so what can you tell uh, people at home what is Food for Fines? Uh, Food for Fines is a program the Missoula Parking Commission is doing in partnership with the Missoula Food Bank um, in order to collect non-perishable food items to support our community um, we are accepting food in lieu of payment for fines. So we're accepting up to five items per person, um, and each item is worth $2 towards your outstanding citation fee. And this is the second year you guys are doing this. How well did you guys do last year? We did really well last year, um, but we would like to get the word out there this year and get even more donations to support the Missoula Food Bank. Cool. So um, do you have any specific goals on how many uh, food items you guys want? That's a great question. Um, all the food items. All the food That's items. That's what we want. <laughs> we have not s set a specific number goal for um, our collection this year, um, but we will be posting on our Facebook page regularly. Um, every Friday of the month of November, we'll be posting how many um, pounds of food have been donated and how many items have been donated so that we can track our our success. And it's always a really clever idea when um, public, uh, I guess, um, I guess public commissions and other uh, uh, public entities, mm -hmm. that's what I was trying to say, um, uh, come up with a nice, cool, fun way to get people to you know, help pay off their fines. Because once you get, a, once you get that uh, little envelope on your thing, you're just like, oh, but Knowing that uh, your donations go to a good cause also help add to the... Uh, yeah, it gives an incentive to get in and pay off your outstanding citations if you've been putting it off because you don't, don't want to pay. It's um, sometimes easier to pay through a donation than it is to actually give cash or money to the commission. So. Yeah. And also, uh, um, 
you you could uh, take it personally to the parking commission, which is at uh, on Main Street, right? Yeah, we're inside of the Central Park parking garage at 128 West Main. Um, we're just on the ground floor there. Um, and we can take donations there Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Cool. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, where can people find more information about this? If you go on our Facebook page, we have um, all of the information up there. And like I said, we'll be posting our our success stories throughout the month to show how much food has been donated. So our Facebook page is really the best place to find information. Or you can always call the Parking Commission. Um, at 552-6250 and we can answer any questions you have about the about donating food all right thank you jody yeah, is thank there you. anything else you want to say no all right well thanks for joining me and i hope you have a wonderful day thank you um right now we got some uh, new programs that are going to be airing on the mcat this week and and here they are and i apologize ladies and gentlemen uh Marion couldn't be here today uh my name is brad pitt and I know it's weird the camera actually takes off weight so it's <laughs> that whole thing is a myth so I actually am giant no one was fooled I'm shocked by that uh, as is my want ladies and gentlemen I am here to proclaim uh, the last three years I've been haunted by water myself um, Thanks. Come on in, kid. I like to I like to give the spiel. She wants to video it. She wants to video it, but I don't want to just give it to the damn camera. <laughs> How boring is that? So come on in. I dare you. You want to hear the story of Nels Peterson, the tuba player of the Missoula City Band? I'm Gary Gillette, and what I what I am is a. Uh, uh, um, I, I direct the Missoula City Band, and I'm writing a book on the Missoula City Band history of it. Uh, that's what led to this being here because of the research that we're dealing with with the Missoula City Band. Uh, he don't care about tuba players in the Missoula City Band, does he? Uh, shoot. Let's see. Hold, hold on. Hold on, buddy. Would this do it? For a little bit, our key, key provisions of due process and equal protection, uh, they aren't tied to citizens. They're tied to persons. And if you look at key provisions of protection for uh, people accused of crimes, uh, they're tied to the accused. They're not tied to citizens as well. But all, any consideration of that uh, went out the window or never was considered. Uh, what they did in, in Fort Missoula for these men, and they thought they were doing them a great favor, the Attorney General established a process which he said was not designed to be a jury trial, but what, what was in, in, intended to give these people the opportunity to prove their innocence. Uh, and. Uh, it was, it was very difficult to do because uh, uh, they set forth the procedure that was to be followed. Uh, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was initiated, the hearings were initiated after each of these men were, was required to fill out an enemy alien questionnaire. Uh, there were 127 questions, I think, on the questionnaire. And if any of you got one of these things, you would go to about the second question and say, you know, you can't ask me about this. I mean, there were every detail of their lives in detail. Okay. Um, and so that was the first thing I did. Um, and then right after that, they took me downstairs because uh, one of the other assistant directors had to leave to do something and the other assistant director wasn't available. So I was the third one on call. So within about 30 minutes of being on set my first day, I was actually standing next to camera calling the roles for the scene where the kid was jumping on the bed with the, with the burgers. So it was an interesting experience because, you know, I didn't know anybody that was there, but there's a process, there's a thing that you do. So knowing your business, knowing your job, it allows you to work as kind of interchangeable parts if you do it really well. Uh, the, first AD, uh, the first AD on this job, however, was crazy. He was a crazy Englishman. And uh, both, both the, me and the other assistant director, uh, had a, it, was, it was difficult to work for him. 
Um, he would spill out, spill out about five things that you're supposed to do. You're going to do this, 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 and this right after we do this next thing. And then we do the next thing, and then you come back and he'd say, now you're going to do this, this, and this, and this. And it was completely different than the five things he gave you before the shot. Um, and then he would want to know why it wasn't already done. So it was kind of difficult. I live uh, uh, near the Clearwater and Blackfoot uh, confluence. Sorry, Sarah. Um, that spirish rock is apparently described in Meriwether Lewis's journals uh, after he split from Clark at Traveler's Rest. Um, you know the story. Uh, Clark heads up the Bitterroot, Lewis heads down the Bitterroot, crosses the Clark Fork, and then heads up the Blackfoot. July 3rd, 1806. A uh, hundred years later, my great-grandparents purchased land near the confluence of the Blackfoot and Clearwater about a year before that 1907 steel bridge was built. How many of you guys know that bridge? Yeah! Um, and uh, they created a guest ranch. And by 1925, it was up and running properly. And this is the same time period that Norman McLean writes about in A River Runs Through It. All right, so the last thing that you saw was Tell Us Something, and it was from Up the Blackfoot, and it talks all about people's experience with the Blackfoot River and correlation with the Norman McLean Festival, which is the, bo is the guy who wrote the book on A River Runs Through It. So that's just a little bit of that, a little taste of history right there. And, of course, Stories and Stones with my boy Gary Gillette from the Missoula City Band. This is the Missoula City Band's repeat will be airing on MCAT pretty much this week, starting with the first week, and it will basically be going on throughout the next couple weeks once again. So um, let's talk about some things that are uh, happening this week as well in terms of some of the movies that you guys are going to be forced to probably see. Let's start off with... From the movie franchise that teaches that North mythology is an ancient alien who can live long times um, comes the third installment of the Thor series that you're watching to see um, that ha to see if it has any tie-ins to the Avengers Infinity War comes Thor Ragnarok, starring a third of the Hemsworth brothers in this movie that follows a superhero who is stripped of his powers and must find a way to save the day before the his world comes to an end. Sound familiar? Well, you've seen it before, and you will probably see it again and again and again forever. Kate Blanchett gets a cut gets cut a check for more than eight million dollars to go pew pew for twenty minutes on screen for screen time. Also, apparently, Carl Urban is in this movie, but of course, nobody cares because Hulk talks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Seriously. Moving on. Um, gather around for. The Christmas season, as we look yet into another raunchy comedy centered around the holiday season, this is a very this is a holiday sequel. And now, and once you go holiday, you cannot make another film. Just think about uh, Christmas Vacation. It was uh, it was the third installment of the Vacation movies, and it was probably the last really good one until they had to remake it and do all this other crap as well. But anyways, this would probably be another excuse to get your girlfriends together and watch a sexy Santa because Lord knows um, you only get uh, less than a minute of shirtless Thor. Um, so skip out on the date movie and watch these movies that will make you glad that you are single. This is not a biopic for uh, LBJ's wife or Hank Hill's dog. Uh, watch a young girl live the life of North Carolina and basically see no black people because Hollywood indie films lack that. So this movie's called Lady Bird. The synopsis is just a girl living in North uh, Carolina, but I'm assuming she's it has to do with getting out of her abusive situation and must start a new life, which gets threatened by her old one, which comes rearing its ugly head, the end, and then blah, blah, blah. She leaves there. I don't know. She Something happens. It's in an indie film, so you know it's going to probably end in tragedy. So that's basically all the movies that are going to come out this week. Uh, there's a couple other movies that are coming out, but I was just like, I've never heard of these movies at all, period. But those are the movies that are coming out. So um, I also, uh, I'm going to break uh, pre-critic tradition by saying that you should go see the movie Loving Vincent. It is an um, experimental um, genre of art, which they used oil painting as animation. So they basically hired over 100 artists to make oil paintings in inspired by Vincent van Gogh. And it tells the story of uh, Vincent van Gogh's suicide and, uh, and uh, basically the, a son of a postman. Um, I was a son of a postman. And uh, he basically tries to solve why um, Vincent van Gogh su uh, committed suicide. Or maybe there was a 
uh, underlying uh, darker themes behind his suicide as well. So find that out, and it's going to be playing at the Roxy all this week here in Missoula. So that's it for Pre-Critic. I have another amazing movie for you guys. It's called Extreme Spookies, Mothman. Extreme. Spooky. Welcome to Extreme Spookies. I'm your host, Dangleman. Today, we're going to be talking about the Mothman. Now, Mothman, is he real? Is he legendary? Who can say, really? I hope the evidence that we present to you tonight will make you decide if he is real or whack. I'm Dangleman, and this is Extreme Spookies. Enjoy. When did you first see the Mothman? Well, man, let me tell you about this. Something that about my Mothman. I got him and my, uh, che uh, my, my friends, Cheesy Joe, uh, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor Swift, um, all those people, and they were just talking about, yo, man, he's like, uh, uh, man, I wish something interesting was to happen, man. It's like, and, and I was like, yo, man, we just gotta be patient. You know, you gotta take, you gotta stop and just like, smell the roses and just kind of think about it. And it's like, whoa! And then uh, as soon after we saw that, we got some, we, Mothman, Moth, 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 Mothman, he just came out of nowhere. He was just like, hey, I'm Mothman. I was like, dude, yeah, you are Mothman. And then you, you just gotta say, like, Mothman is like, just chilling out and like, you know, he's just kind of thinking and he's just like, Mothman's like, you know, where, where does this begin? Where this is him, and Mothman is like, you know, I, I, you know, there's no beginnings to end with the Mothman, he just exists. He's a Mothman, and the man, and the man, and the man, and everything like that. So yeah, I saw Mothman. So you want the story of Mothman, right? Yes, how did you meet the Mothman? Well, you see, I was, uh, I was inside my kitchen, right? And I turn around, and the next thing I know, there he is. Terrifying. I ran, I ran into my, my kitchen closet to grab, grab my good old hat and this, and this armor to keep me safe from him. But then when I came back out, he was gone. It's a demon from hell, I tell you. How long ago was this? You're him, aren't you? You. Get, get this, get this stuff off me. Out here this time of night. Stop being such a scaredy cat, you hecking hecker. I want to see if I'm going to get some reception out of here. What was your experience with Mothman? Uh, he kidnapped me. Can you elaborate? Didn't you see the intro? Do you remember anything from the incident? Uh, yes. What happened? He dragged me away to a shed in the woods. Do you remember what happened after that? Uh, yes, I, I, I kinda do remember. Uh, uh, it, it was very, very dark. What did he do? I don't know, I blacked out. What was your experience with the Mothman? I don't think, I think that Owen had the, exp I didn't have an experience, uh, except for that Owen got taken, but that's his experience, I was just there. Can you explain what happened? I, I went to take a hashtag selfie and then post it to Twittergram. And when I just looked up, he, Owen was gone. And I was like, why'd you do that to me, man? Why'd you leave? Have you spoken to Owen since his encounter? Sort of. Can you elaborate? 
I uh, I I talked to Owen, but it I don't think it was he was the one talking. What do you mean? I think that the moss man implanted implanted his larva into his mind and body and soul. What effect do you believe that this is having on Owen? I I don't know. I haven't really noticed any real effects yet. But I imagine that he eventually he will grow a a like pocket in his stomach and then he will and then the little mothmen will grow inside him and when they come out of his uh the pocket out of his chest it's gonna be like it's gonna be right here and right about here they'll just explode out and killing him in the process and i don't know what i'll do when that happens do you believe in the mothman uh no i i don't think that the mothman's real i think anybody that thinks the mothman is real is a moron they're just not smart people I, I'd, I'd never encountered him and I think all of it's folklore why do you think that? I, uh, my, my buddies just keep on making up these rumors like oh man I, I got attacked by the mothman oh jeez and I just I just don't I don't believe them I, 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 they don't have any solid evidence Would you say that the hoax is made for any specific reason? Um, maybe the hoax is made just to make people feel better about themselves. I don't know. They're, they have such pitiful lives. I don't know. It's, it's really silly about all the hoaxes that come up in the news these days about ghosts and werewolves and vampires, especially around Halloween. It just seems kind of silly. And you're sure you've had no experience with the Mothman? There was this one time, all right? That was our presentation on Mothman. Such an interesting topic. Just remember everybody, as we think about Mothman, we need to keep each other in line and trust in ourselves and pray that he is real. Now, that was Extreme Spookies. My name is Dangleman. I'll see you later. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for some City Council. City Council uh, is talking about all sorts of wonderful things, including replacing Ward uh, num R Ward 2 member Ruth Sweeney. Um, so that's, uh, that happened on Wednesday. Committee means they interviewed some more people. Um, this is about like nine people are gonna, are, have been officially interviewed, and you can log on to ci.missoula.mt.us via the Committee of the Whole, November 1st and October 25th, to f find out all these people who may be representing your ward for Ward 2. They will be appointed by the City Council. Since the whole election thing was just like, huh, that's weird, and Ruth Sweeney's uh, name is still on the uh, Ward 2 ticket, so you really can't vote for her since he's out. Anyways, moving on, let's talk about admin and finance. Uh, according to Dale Bickle, there hasn't been an impact fee study in Missoula since 2004, and it's required by the state, required, every five years. So we're a little, pa well, the city's a little past due on that one. So the city needs to engage professional consultants who are familiar with the impact fees and impact fee methodologies to perform a study to ensure that the city of Missoula is living up to our sanitary obligations. So Chief Administration as Chief Administrator uh, Dale, Bicker, Dale Bickle with the City of Missoula talks about how they're going to tackle this study. It's warming up. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, looks like it froze on me now. All right. Let me see if I can get that relaunched or something like that. Mm hmm. It's good. It's a good quote. I promise you. Oh, there, there is some sound right there. So I will skip ahead to. Bear with me. 
Okay, here's his quote. I hope. <laughs> you know what our needs are. Um, task five: evaluate different allocation methodologies. There's different ways we can calculate impact fees, whether it's on a, a incremental expansion basis, where um, it's kind of kind of similar follows kind of growth patterns like population, or if there is going to be big facilities needs, like we need to build a collector road in one particular area because of growth, and and so those are. Um, those um, credits, if a, if a private entity, a developer is building a bunch of infrastructure that's going to benefit and be eligible, they can receive a credit against those and they need to calculate those things. Um, task seven is the con conduct funding and cash flow analysis. That's uh, um, related to um, understanding how, how much of the, how much impact fees can support um, the, the capital needs we're seeing in the future. Um, and then there's the, the actual final impact fee report and public presentations. Um, all right, so basically it's all about uh, collecting data, and then, of course, they're going to do a presentation after the fact. So uh, Tischler Bates, um, who is being contracted by the city of Missoula for $114,000 of this impact study, mind you, uh, has prepared over 900 impact fees and over 800 fiscal impact analysis for clients across the United States and Canada. Uh, Tischler Bice will be... Uh, will be uh, the leading expert on fiscal and economic analysis, revenue enhancement, and, and the cost of growth strategies. So um, when businesses come to Missoula and they want to uh, build, they're trying to figure out a way that best suits the uh, growth and also the population that would uh, basically adapt to that uh, business. So think about it like this. You want to have a business, but you also want your employees to be able to get to your business. So you uh, build you build that, but also have uh, you get credit for help boosting the economy as well. So this is a way for businesses to get uh, credit and get uh, I guess uh, an incentive. I keep on forgetting that word incentive to come to Missoula and grow their business. So here's Dale Bickle, who uh, is asked about low income housing, and this is how he responds to that. Look at our structure now. So we have, you know, we have various impact fees for a single family house based on size. And what we found that I think is that there may be, there may be opportunities for smaller ones. Um, um, you know, like mini houses and stuff, they have to pay a same impact fee as another a larger structure. So that, there is that one opportunity. Um, some communities do have um, some affordable housing programs. One of the, one of the, the rules surrounding impact fees is that they really can't be waived because that that, um, that impact fee is is designed to pay that share of growth and it can't be it's not supposed to be waived so what other communities have done is essentially establish a fund that will help pay for those um, impact fees and, we, and we've talked about that with the consultant all um, right so uh, that's uh, one of the many things that were asked about Dale Buckle about um, upcoming, you know, like uh, affordable housing and whatnot like that. Um, of course, John Wilkins is very skeptical on this because he feels as though that this feels like it's a waste of money along the way. I think impact fees makes the cost of construction go up. So it's not good for affordable housing when you're, you know, charging more for impact fees. Uh, what I notice in my uh, that impact fees are in certain areas. I mean, they belong. If if something's built in my area, the impact fee stays in my area. Is that correct? Um, currently, under the um, the in the city's past impact fee plans, they they designated the impact fee areas as the entire city limits. So it so there hasn't been a designated geographical area for each impact fee. Um, however. Impact fees have to pay for growth, and so, um, um, so like in transportation impact fees, for example, I mean where the growth is happening is tend to where we tend to invest them. But there all is right, so that was uh, Dale Bickle talking more about uh, some of the things where people invest in, um, in terms of that. John Wilkins is against this study, and Dale Bickle states that this is a study would find out if the, this economic impact study 
would find out whether or not these fears are actually justified or not in terms of like if you have impact study and where you have growth and where the money can go you can find out how much money can be invested in like low-income neighborhoods versus um, the business commercial areas commercial residential mixture areas um, it, it's all within the city limits so that's just one of those things is that they're definitely trying to figure out to help improve uh, basically uh, places to uh, put money into so uh, the right money in the right places that's what the impact study fee is for but it's also reactive to any certain population growths that are happening in the city of Missoula. Marilyn Marler is of course worried about her, her ward in Ward 6 and um, this is what she had to say. My neighborhood in Ward 6 we are having a lot of appropriate infill housing and then the existing neighbors wonder you like well they're it's adding more traffic to the streets and we, we need more basic infrastructure like sidewalks and such and so um, I think that I think that it's beneficial <laughs> to help I mean as some I, I, I wonder if I don't expect you to have a whole list of everything the impact fees were being used on but I would guess that the third street project um, when that went through um, is an example of one and probably think probably think of others all right, so that was uh, Marilyn Marler worried about infill and about with um, with more people coming into there. Of course, the state does require this study um, for this attached contract with Tischler Dice for $114,030 to perform an impact fee study and updates that are required by uh, under MCA 7-6-1602. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what's going to happen, and that's just one of the things that are going to be found out. And this impact study, which is required every five years, hasn't been done since 2004. Uh, moving on, uh, more Committee of the Whole. This is usually like the original uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, O-C-O-W. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the Missoula Economic Partnership showed up at the regular scheduled Committee meeting of the Whole meeting. It's part of their uh, quarterly update. Uh, grants that uh, help business kickstart in Missoula will help boost job growth. Unfortunately, these grants shelf life is in 2019 so 2019 is where some of these kickstarting um, businesses here in Missoula are being um, can be threatened with um, by the incoming legislature so James uh, Grunty president CEO of um, the Missoula Economic Partnership talks about some of the problems that he foresees in the future including this 2019 most every economic development program that the state of Montana offers are called these 2019 programs, and they're called that because that's the year they expire. Um, they, the Department of Commerce is looking at a strategy to get those reauthorized, but it, it, it may be that they all go away. Um, and this could be a part of it is, um, so I don't have the answer today, but they're, they're in real jeopardy to be going away in after the, in the next legislative session, which would severely limit our ability to reward companies. Montana has very few incentives to begin with. One of the areas that is always under attack would be TIFs or URDs. That is also has a study committee. Um, the grand total of these 2019 programs is fairly insignificant. Uh, it seems like it's around $20 million or less is all that's being dedicated towards economic development programs. And out of that massive amount of budget, uh, that's a minuscule amount of money. Um, but it, it, it will be under threat. Um, I know that um, uh, the department director, Pam Cody, is going to be meeting with our board of directors later this month to talk about what their strategy is. And I haven't seen it outlined yet. All right, so uh, just so you guys know, a, t a TIF is a tax increment fund, which can be put into place to help uh, increase certain taxes in certain areas to help pay for infrastructure costs and other things as well, um, including um, some taxes on businesses so they can improve the uh, basically uh, area economically, like you know, like sidewalk improvement, that kind of thing, through that kind of stuff. Anyways, let's not get into that. We're talking about the ec Mizzou Economic Partnership. Um, so the next thing that uh, that it gets quoted is from Heidi West, and she com comments about employability. But let's, because, of course, I want to throw it back to some more tidbits, of course, because Missoula is such a small town, according to the e e these these economic growth committees, that many solutions have been done on the local level with less federal assistance than most places. 
Um, during this meeting, they talked about the average wage compared to the household costs, also with a 56% employable rate according to the recent Mon Missoula study. It makes it interesting to see how many how Missoula compares um, to the national average. Uh, also, the graph that I showed you beforehand t talks about how uh, it showed you that um, um, other that more people who are employed live outside of Missoula versus inside the city of Missoula as well. So that's just one of the things that uh, I always f I found interesting about people who work in Missoula but don't live in Missoula. Um, Heidi West uh, comments about employability in terms of of just yeah I mean of uh, of how interesting it is for people to be employable. Their workforce potentially uh, is lacking in critical thinking skills, um, and I think there's a little bit of a dichotomy between what you're saying and maybe what we hear from the university in our quarterly updates and the direction that they're going as an institution. And so I was a little bit curious how, I mean, there was a little bit of, you know, future workforce development, but how this information is getting um, transmitted to the university, um, especially because I'm a big uh, fan of liberal arts, um, and I, I do think there's critical thinking skills in those programs. Um, it seems like some of those are on the cutting block a lot lately. Just curious how you're communicating with the university about these results. All right, so... Um that's uh, just um, that it was Heidi West talking about some of the um, studies that were done through the university since the university has their own records they keep as well um, versus the city of Missoula's records, which are usually just not really existent too much, but they do do some studies um, and stuff whatnot like that. But here is James uh, Grunty and responding to Heidi West's comment. And I think we've talked about that a little bit in the past. We think if we can get this hub or the quarterback or whatever we want to call this, part of the problem is having taken liberal arts students, which I was one, um, and be able to s s speak my skills to business, right? It's not that they don't have them. They don't know how to speak to each other. And that's one of the things that we looked at in the recommendation of, of how do we translate those skills in, into how business thinks and vice versa, a business to understand why those skills matter. And that's why we think it's really going to be critical. Right now we have lots of little pieces doing workforce development, but there's no central. It's not really any different than when MEP was created, right? What's the central entry point into understanding the system? And that's where we think we can get there. All right, so that basically uh, concludes the committee of the whole meeting in the afternoon. This was a discussion-only item um, that is available on the city website. Um, you can also download the slideshow and look at some of the information as part of the meeting rather than the overview with me. So the whole meeting is available by going on to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website for anybody interested in finding out what the city is doing um, with uh, your tax money. So you go to Agenda, Webcast Minutes, and the city meets and they talk about uh, um, things they want to do and things that they have to do and things that basically keep the wheels turning here in the city of Missoula and basically keeping the lights on and the water flowing. Uh, ha, ha. Anyways, um, <laughs> you can click on any of these meetings. So far, uh, Wednesday had a uh, committee of the whole twice. One, of course, was to replace um, um, Ruth Sweeney's War Two seat. The other one was admin finance with Dale Bickle, where he talked about some of the um, um, Oh, man, what was he talking about? But anyways, uh, Committee of the Whole, uh, where they did talk about the Missoula Economic Partnership as well. And, yeah, and the, all sorts of uh, things happening with the city of Missoula. So um, before I move on to, uh, let's see, what was I going to move on to today? Oh, uh, yeah, I have a nice little cute video for you guys. But I do want to talk about uh, where you guys can find out more information about MCAT. You can always go to MCAT.org. MCAT.org is your resource for everything uh, visual uh, documentation of the Missoula culture. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about uh, Missoula's culture, you go to MCAT.org, and we basically have videos from past um, um, lectures, rallies, causes here in the city of Missoula. You just have to click on any of these links. Uh, Channel 189 is your public. Um, arts, dancing, all sorts of wonderful, cool concert things. Uh, Channel 190 is all your government meetings like I just kind of showed you guys. You can also go to the city's website, but if you can't find it there, you'll definitely be able to find it on our website at MCAT.org. If you want more information about my morning show, you can go to wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. You can find interviews, 
You can find past Wake Up Missoula episodes. You can also find some fun little videos that I do, Flagship Friday, dubbing stuff, and of course the interviews. And I'm always going to plug this, my stop motion and um, anthology, which is over an hour long of stop animated Lego imagination porium stuff. So I'm just like making up words that don't make sense. Anyways, I have a nice little cute video, and I want to give a plug to our very own uh, producer from MCAT, ASAP Adonai. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about um, some of the. Uh, I'm going to give you your art guide to. Uh, oh man, I'm just like, I'm really blanking now. I'm thinking too much. I'm going to give you guys an art guide to First Friday. It is First Friday today, and I'm going to talk about First Friday right after this. Oliver. Okay, Oliver, go ahead and try it. Play anything you want. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what, you do that and I'll add some notes on it. How about that? Ready? Ready? Oh, okay. Ready? There you go. <laughs> I'll tell you something about that song. The name of that song is called Heart and Soul. You know what year that song came out? No, I just remember. 1983. No, that song came out in 1939. Whoa. It was a lady named B. Uh, B. Wayne. She really? played. She was a professional singer with an orchestra called Larry Clinton Orchestra back in 1939, and they did a really slow version of that song. And then eventually, people started playing it on the piano. So that's the history of that song. All right, so uh, that was a little bit of taste of ASAF Cafe. ASAF Cafe airs every Thursday night at around 5.30 p.m., but of course, if you're interested in being on one of his tapings of his show, come down to MCAT between 11 and 1 p.m., um, and you get a hangout, uh, maybe drink some coffee, have a little lunch, and listen to ASAF stories and play some music and just talk. It's a nice little chill um, talk show. So you guys can do that. Um, but let's talk about some things that are happening for First Friday, um, starting with... Don't Tell My Dad. Yes, that is the name of an art installation happening at Betty's Divine. They know how to work a room. Uh, and in this November, uh, in this November f first Friday at Betty's Divine, the annual Please Don't Tell My Dad collaborative art show in Divine Trash, Betty's in-house vintage department, a one-night-only collective show of obscure, vulgar, and, and embarrassing art featuring a multitude of local artists, some of whom would rather not be named. And this is from 6 to 8. Grab a, a Miller Lite in a bottle and a mini bag of Doritos and have our backyard to catch local acts. So, um, Close But No Cigar, Missoula's premier Bob Seeger cover band. Um, it's Close But No Seeger, so you get it. Um, it uh, so no kids, no cops, no creeps. It's 18 and up. Um, and yes, they will be checking IDs and um, don't tell our dads. Um, up next, they got another event happening in for First Friday. It's at Radius Gallery. Stop by the closing reception of Minefields Exhibits. It is an exploratory between many a multitude of artists here in Missoula who came together for this show, and this is the last, last, last chance to check out Minefields. Um, also happening uh, at the Missoula Art Museum is that it's the Shed s slash After Now colon work by Linda Stout. Um, in 2016, bitter artist Linda Stout made a generous offer to uh, uh, to gift her works to the MAMS collection. The ex exhibit features 24 artworks that were selected from the voluminous offerings. The Stout made it available. When Stout's husband of 42 years died of cancer in 2012, part of her grieving process was to make art. And you can check that all out happening from 5 to 8 p.m. tonight, tonight at, the Missoula, uh, at the Missoula Art Museum or pretty much any time. I think this will be going on until December, late December. Um, so you guys can check that out. And usually uh, for a lot of times, uh, a lot of these artists who are featured at uh, the Missoula Art Museum do talks around 7 o'clock. So you don't want to miss that that day. So First Friday at La Stella Blue is doing uh, with uh, Carly Prentice. So Flux... It's called Flux. Flux is an explorator, uh, exploration of water and our local environment through the fabric and mapping of local artist uh, Carly uh, Prentice. Like the bodies of water that inspired it, the work seeks to find balance between movement and static, chaos and quiet, gentleness and resilience. So you get to check that out. It's going to be at La Stella Blue. So moving on, we got some steampunk for anybody who likes steampunk because there's always the people who like steampunk. And I'm more like... Hey, steampunk, that's cool. 
that's that's me. I'm like I'm five percent. I'm I'm like five percent steampunk. Um, like, but I'm like 100% punk, but anyways, <laughs> Bernice's Bakery is ho ho hosting an art by Linda Cohen, um, no relation to the Cohen brothers, I think, uh, gears, clockworks, and unusual, uh, repurposed items for the integral part of their mixed media art and clocks. Um, while steampunk and industrial style continues to intrigue her, uh, they, she has recently been exploring fluid and acrylic painting, creating pieces that stand alone and incorporating the, this technique into the Mixed Media Arts. The next art installation is Here and Now by Soon Kim. This is Frontier Space Gallery. It's in the alleyway just between, um, it's, it's an interesting alleyway. And you'll see a giant gate that's kind of open. It's the alleyway between Wardens and Pine Street. So if you go to Wardens, you turn around and you see a little uh, throughway. That is where the Frontier Space is. So it's Korean artist Soon Kim joins, uh, joins from Bozeman, uh, Montana, an exhibit opening from 5 to 9 p.m. Soon Kim was born and raised in South Korea. She received a MFA in painting drawing from Montana State University. Currently, she lives and works in Bozeman, Montana. Kim uses the medium of painting, drawing, print, printmaking, and installation to question the viewer's sense of anticipation, reality, and familiarity, both in the authority in which she physically makes her work and the intellectual and process discourse that engages. That sh it engages in. Sorry about that. So, that's what's happening there. So um, we got some oil paints by uh, Patty Jo Thomas. Look at that. I think that's beautiful. So it's Montana made, and it's going to be at the artist shop. Patty Jo Thomas, a self-taught artist and sixth grade, sixth gen generation Montana, shares her collection of oil paintings. Wow, self-taught. Look at that. That's self-taught. And that's a painting. It's ridiculous. But, uh, the Blackbird, it's a conspiracy. Um, it's happening at the Four Ravens Gallery, uh, no joke. Uh, a flock of ravens is called a conspiracy, and a flock of crows is called a murder. So, uh, Four Ravens Gallery is hosting one of their fifth invitational shows of Blackbird-inspired art, um, showcasing photography, watercolor, clay, pastels, and copper uh, enameling. Um, Enameling, sorry about that. Um, artists include Larry Black, um, Blackbird, uh, Mary <laughs> Oshlager, um Kathy Weber, Trudy Scari, uh, Brenda Wolf, and Sheila Evans. So um, once again, Mary Oschlager is also uh, the subject of a Four Ravens uh, Look Before You Speak episode. So you guys can check that out anytime by going on to MCAT.org. We got two more art installations before I wrap up the art guide for you guys. The Clay Studio of Missoula is doing a reception for UM graduates and post back um, BACC exhibit. So an exhibit featuring the talented artists currently at the University of Montana, hosted by Clay Studio of Missoula, features ceramic pottery and sculptures by current University of Montana ceramic MFA candidates Ryan Caldwell and Corey uh, Krumrein, uh, Stephanie Dish Dishno, uh, Dean Le Leper, Leper, sorry, and Molly uh, Streif, uh, plus works by current post-baccalaureate students Ryan Embry, Michael McCollin, and Maya M Moan. So that's a whole bunch of clay arts at the Clay Studio, so you can check that out tonight from 5 to 8 p.m. Up next, we got Paul Teagan, photography at Market on Front Street. So Market on Front Street is a uh, is in the par new parking garage right across from the Elks Lodge, and this is photography, fine arts, landscapes, and nature photography. So you can check that out and more uh, just by wandering around the downtown scenes. There's going to be a lot of things happening in the downtown scene, and I suggest you all go check it out. But that's pretty much it for all your art walk and art installation. Um, let's see, do I have anything else for you guys in terms of First Friday stuff? I pretty much uh, used all my clips for you guys. Um, I do want to kind of, I do, I probably should go through uh, some of the um, events that are happening this week as well. Um, let's see. Let me just find it. All right, so you guys want to know about Friday? I'll tell you about Friday. So uh, Mismo and uh, Mizzou Indoor Sports Arena has some indoor fun for this winter advisory warning happening from about around 9.30 to 12 uh, this morning for any kids who want to do flips and tricks. Um, Roots Acro Sports Center starts at 11 a.m. Uh, Tiny Tales and Story Time for kids who want to learn to read. And this is usually for kids walking to five years of age between Tiny Tales and Story Time. Um, Yarns and Watercolors is also at the Mizzou Public Library, so you get a either um, stitch, or you can watercolor. Starting at 12 p.m. Uh, uh, but of course, starting at 12:30 p.m. If you're interested in card games, Bridge and Cribbage is at the Missoula Senior Center. Teen Writers Group is happening 3:30 p.m. in the afternoon. 
And uh, if you guys want to celebrate Salvador Dali, um, Families for Children Museum is doing a Celebrate Salvador Dali from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, and and it basically it's special programming artist uh, in honor of artist Salvador Dali. So it's a way for kids to have their own First Friday enjoyment at the Families for Children's Museum. So um, Currents is having a date night. So Currents Aquatic Center, um, you can enjoy your dinner date and explore First Friday art events well, without the kids in tow. You can drop the kids off at Currents for supervised fun in the pool and pizza dinner. Meet, uh, it meets Fridays, November 3rd, 5 to 8 p.m. Registration fee is $15 per child. Basically a way to get rid of your kids for an hour. Home Resource Annual Benefit Auction. The Wilma is hosting a um, the home resource uh, returns to the Wilma for a night of food, friends, and the most handcrafted auction in town. They'll be started 14 years of business, a uh, cultural, and reuse of a more vibrant and sustainable local economy in Missoula. And this happens at f for First Friday at 5 p.m. Family Friendly Friday is at Top Hat Lounge. If you are interested in keeping your kids in tow and not um, dropping them off at Currents Aquatic Center, bring them to a bar and drink and have your kids run around um, basically the the more drinks you have the more you start acting like your kids that's just how it is <laughs> and of course i just do want to give a nice little plug to mama mia mama, mama mia is going to be at mct for the last weekend so tonight um four and there's like five more shows left um tonight um you got two shows on saturday and two shows on sunday a matinee and a night show and 7 30 p.m check it out um Man, talk about the Missoula events that night. Um, let's talk. <laughs> wait, that, that's what I wrote. For, that's a note for myself. I, d I shouldn't have said that out loud. Let's talk about some of the events for uh, the late night crew that are interested in going late night. So, Walking Corpse Syndrome is going to be at the Dark Horse and is going to be joined by Trash Panda. It's going to be rock music. Dakota Poor. I really want to see Trash Panda, not because I've heard him before, but it sounds like a really awesome name. Dakota Poor Men is going to be the Sunrise Saloon. There's going to be basically three bands playing in the same building complex because Sunrise Saloon and the, uh, and the Dark Horse are just one big building. Um, Mudslide Charlie is going to be at the Union Club. Drop Culture is going to be at the Badlander. And Dead Larry is going to be at the Top Hat Lounge um, tonight. So there's a lot of things happening tonight in terms of those events. I'm going to switch cameras, and I'm going to transition to Saturday. Unfortunately, there is no more... Farmer's Market and People's Market. Last weekend was the last weekend. But if you guys want to do something, um, they're doing a Met Metcalf Refugee Attracts Late Migrants at 8.45 a.m. UM Adam Center parking lot, northwest corner. Waterfowl and other migrants are flying south, and the Metcalf Refuge ne near Stevensville attracts many of these birds. Join Fallon Valley five valleys autobahn for a full day uh, trip to discover these species bring a lunch and binoculars arts and crafts fair in missoula senior center starting at 9 a.m so if there's a lot of crafts fair happening missoula senior center you got a holiday crafts fair at the first lutheran uh, classical school is hosting their sixth annual craft fair uh, no joke um, and it's no fee there's a arlie uh, brown building that if you know the brown building in arlie then you're good so 2017 Arley Bazaar, it's another uh, crafts fair. It's wonderful. Missoula Are We Ready uh, Preparedness Fair. So this is from the LDS Church. Um, come learn about the home ignition zones from the Zordon, Copton, and DNRC, enhancing emergency prep uh, preparedness through household risk assessments and Ryan Lee from State of Montana Emergency Preparedness. Um, they got the International Games Week gaming event. Missoula Public Library is hosting Mario Kart and other Fun games during the game day events as part of the International Games Week, which occurs in the large meeting room during this event. They also have their tabletop games available for pre free play all day, and they'll be debuti debuting the newest game added to the collection. And this happens from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the large meeting room. Last day of Buy the Bike is going to be at the Missoula Art Museum. Today is the last, uh, okay, so tomorrow, sorry, I'm reading the synopsis, so uh, bear with me. So Mizzou Art M Museum is doing the last day to view the exhibit by the bike. So it's right next to the bike, not by, but technically it is by to buy the bike. In the Mizzou Art Park, stop by the corner at Patty and Pine this weekend before the sculptures are, re are de installed next week. And, of course, uh, once uh, the Grizz football versus North Arizona game goes into full swing, nothing else happens in downtown Missoula. So 
Um, so basically, that's what's happening. And the game starts at 3.30 p.m., so you can come show some support for the Grizz, but of course, they'll probably be playing at any of these sports bars along the way. Um, so here are your late night events for your Saturday night. If you're interested in going out, the Dark Horse is um, um, hosting Hambone at 9 p.m. You got Dakota Poor Man at the Sunrise Saloon. Um, you got usually a Sunrise Saloon does uh, their band two nights in a row, which is pretty cool. So if they did a really good night the first night, they do it again the second night. Um, I think it's really cool that they do that. Um, some bands only get to play once, and that's it, and you miss out on it. So it's always cool that they do that twi two nights in a row. So just a little props to the Sunrise Saloon on that one. Um, absolutely, Chris Moon is going to be playing uh, Badlander. It's the club here in um, Missoula, so you guys get to check on that. Wow, my coffee is really kicking in. Um, Idle Ranch Hands is going to be at the Union Club. Karaoke at VFW. Shake Well is going to be at the Top Hat Lounge. So if you want some cool toe-tapping funk music, you guys can enjoy that as well. Um, let's see. And then, of course, there's only one kind of thing that's happening Sunday, and in, in, in it's called Encaustic Workshop. So... Uh, this is day workshop designed to give artists a hands-on introduction with an encaustic process. A one-hour de demonstration is followed by immediate work time given per uh, participants. So it's like it's like scrapbooking for artists, basically. Uh, and it's uh, encaustic workshop starting at 11 a.m. Sunday morning. Whew! That's a lot of events that are happening. And that's basically all I had to say about that. I don't know if, uh, I think I went over an hour, so uh, thanks for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, um, see you later.